As we've learned in our previous unit, our ability to function depends on our brain, and our brain is divided up in ways to aid our ability to function, even if we don't always understand exactly how or why that is. Nonetheless, we do know that the brain helps us interpret the stimulus around us and organize it in various ways. In today's lesson, we'll continue to explore this idea by examining the concept of sensation. The term sensation refers to a process, the process by which our sensory receptors and our nervous system receive and represent stimuli from our environment. And to be clear, as long as our brains are working as they're supposed to, our sensory receptors and nervous system are always receiving and representing environmental stimuli, even when we're asleep. In contrast to sensation, perception, which is also a process, describes how our brains organized and interpret sensory stimuli, which then enables us to recognize meaningful objects and events. Without this second piece, the process of perception, our brains would just continually fire after receiving stimuli, but we wouldn't be able to make sense of that stimulus. When processing sensation and perception, our bodies and brains use two different systems. Sensation is bottom-up processing. It starts at the sensory receptors and works its way up through levels of processing through which we come to understand what we've sensed. Perception, on the other hand, is top-down processing. Our brains construct perception by taking sensory stimuli into account and drawing on our prior experiences and expectations to help us identify the sensation. Sensing and perceiving, bottom-up processing and top-down processing, these things are all happening at the very same time. And if it's true, and it is, that our bodies and brains are always experiencing sensory stimuli, then how in the world are we able to focus? The bottom line is, if all humans did was feel buffeted by the many sensations we experienced, then we as a species would have died out pretty quickly, right? A human who's not paying attention to the environment around them would be easy prey for any number of other apex predators. However, our brains have developed the ability to pay selective attention, to hyperfocus on certain sensations and ignore others, thanks, in part, to an awesome little structure in our brains called the reticular formation. Think about it like this. Right at this moment, you're sitting somewhere or laying somewhere, and you're wearing clothes. But you might not have thought about that until I just mentioned it. Now, focus on what's going on around you. Can you hear the air conditioner or a fan? Maybe noise from the kitchen or another room. Maybe noise from outside, cars passing by, dogs barking. Take a moment to become fully aware of where you are. Now realize, when your attention is focused on something else, something you're watching or reading, like this lesson, or maybe something you're listening to, your brain just filtered out the sensations caused by your clothing and all the other stuff in your environment. That's an example of selective attention. And our brains selectively attend to certain stimuli all the time. As we consciously focus on certain stimuli we sometimes ignore, become blind to other stimuli which might be pretty obvious otherwise. This is called inattentional blindness, when we fail to see visible objects because we become so focused on one stimulus. It's important to note that this inattentional blindness doesn't just affect our visual sense. We can ignore noises or even touches because we're so hyper-focused on other stimuli. While our bodies and brains are constantly bombarded with various stimuli, all stimuli are not created equal. Some of the stimuli in our environment might be so faint that they don't actually register in our sensory receptors. Gustav Flechner, a 19th century German psychologist, was the first scientist to study human awareness of stimuli in an effort to determine our absolute thresholds, the minimum stimulation needed to detect a particular stimulus 50% of the time. 
Fechner used a variety of methods to determine the average human's minimum stimulation level. He determined that most humans would be able to detect light from a significant distance. He translated his research this way. On an utterly dark, clear night, a person standing on a mountaintop would be able to see a single candle flame atop another mountain 30 miles away. Most of us can feel a bee's wing falling on our cheek from a centimeter high. We can smell a drop of perfume in a three bedroom apartment, taste a teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water, and we can hear a watch ticking from 20 feet away. These descriptions give us a sense of a human's absolute threshold for sensation. Stimuli that falls below the absolute threshold that you cannot detect at least 50% of the time is called subliminal. It's possible, even probable, that your sensory receptors take note of these subliminal stimuli, but the reception is so faint that your brain never processes the perception of the stimulus. But just because your brain may not process the stimulus, just because the stimulus was subliminal, does not mean that it goes completely unnoticed. Multiple studies have shown that the visual sense is particularly affected by priming, when the brain, often unconsciously, does minimally process stimuli such that the image or text seen predisposes one's perception, memory, or response. Take a look at this image. If pictures flashed, bread, juice, butter, and then this word missing a letter, your brain might be predisposed to assume that the missing letter is a U because you're looking at food. Absolute thresholds indicate the lowest level of stimulus to which we respond, but humans also need to be able to detect differences among stimuli. It's great that we can hear soft sounds, but you can't be a musician if you can't detect the difference between notes. We learn to detect differences in thousands of stimuli we can tell our friends' voices apart. Most of us can distinguish between multiple hues of the same color. We can even sometimes tell when it's our dog barking and not the neighbor's. This ability to detect differences is called the difference threshold. It is the minimum difference a person can detect between any two stimuli half of the time. In the 19th century, Dr. Ernst Weber, Gustav Fechner's research partner, developed an easy way to describe the difference threshold. His description is known as Weber's Law. He stated that, in order for the average person to perceive a difference between stimuli, the two stimuli must differ by a constant minimum percentage, not a constant amount. So, for instance, two light bulbs must differ in intensity by at least 8% in order for the average person to detect a difference between the two light bulbs. Now, despite our brain's amazing ability to detect stimuli, it is possible for us to become so accustomed to specific stimulus that our brains begin to ignore it. Basically, when we are constantly exposed to a stimulus that does not change, most of us become less aware of that stimulus over time. We experience sensory adaptation. Remember earlier in the lesson when I asked you to consciously think about the clothes you're wearing? For most of us, as long as our clothing is relatively comfortable, the stimuli that our clothing produces eventually seems to just stop. Our sensory receptors become so accustomed to the stimuli, we become so adapted to it, that we just stop feeling our clothes until it starts to bother us. These principles of sensation, such as sensory adaptation and sensory thresholds, are an important part of our ability to understand the world around us. We'll explore the various senses themselves in later lessons.